Good morning, church. We've got a home on the other side. Wasn't that beautiful? Thank you, choir, for singing that Negro spiritual so rhythmically and eloquently. We're looking forward to that great day. Didn't you enjoy all the music today? We're looking forward to that great day when the saints go marching in on that great getting up morning because there's plenty good room. So thank you, Brother Amos, for the invitation and Oakwood Church. It's a privilege to be with you to worship our great God who gave the slaves so much hope and who gives us hope today. I'm so happy to be with you today. Our God is a great deliverer. Does anyone believe that? He is in the delivering business from creation to this very present moment. God steps onto the pages of our lives. He knows our story and he wants to deliver each of us from whatever holds us back from walking up the King's Highway joyfully and into the glorious realm of everlasting life, that great place on the other side that they sang about today. God knows us, he loves us, he made us, and he delivers us. Today we're going to look at three different people groups and compare and contrast how God has delivered his people. The topic today is the great deliverer. The Negro spiritual asks the question, didn't my Lord deliver Daniel? Let us pray. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God of Sojourner, Harriet, and Frederick, God of the Oakwood Seventh-day Adventist Church, we praise you for your magnificent love, for giving us hope, for dying for us. Please bless your word to our lives today. And may the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth bring glory to your name, O oh God, our great deliverer. Amen. Amen. The first people group to consider today is the Israelites. Israelites trace their history back to Father Abraham. Prior to their captivity in Egypt, Abram was a man of great riches, and when his name was changed to Abraham, he was promised to become a father of many nations great riches, and many nations. Years later, his descendants were enslaved in a foreign land, Egypt, and held in bondage for hundreds of years. Their suffering was great. Now let's take a look at another people group, African Americans. African Americans trace their history back to Mother Africa. Prior to their captivity in America, Africans, like Father Abraham, had great riches and was a land of many nations. Great riches and many nations. 
Years later, Africa's descendants, like the Israelites, were enslaved in a foreign land, America, and held in bondage for hundreds of years. Their suffering was great. In contrast, Israelite slavery was unlike American slavery. In Egypt, the Israelites were allowed to remain in their family units, to live together as husband and wife, and to name, nurture, and live with their own children. Consider the case of baby Moses, who while enslaved in Egypt, lived with his mother Jacobed, his father Amram, and his siblings Miriam and Aaron. Jochebed was able to care for and nurse her own baby. American slavery was different. It's called chattel slavery. Enslaved Africans were not allowed to remain as family units. They were treated as animals. Legal marriage was not allowed. Children were sold away from their parents. Men were used as breeders, like animals, and slave owners often named the children and selected a new last name for the adults. Slaves were considered property, like animals, to be bought, sold, traded, or inherited. Family units were destroyed. Consider the case of young Frederick Douglass, whose father was allegedly the slave owner and who only saw his mother about two times. American slavery was inhumane. Now back to Abraham. Abraham had great riches. Let's read together Genesis 24 and 35. Together, the Lord has greatly blessed my master so that he has become rich and he has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and servants and maids and camels and donkeys. Likewise, Africa had great riches, diamonds, gold, sapphire and emeralds, copper, timber, flocks and animals. In 1324, Mansa Musa of Mali had so much gold that when he took his famous trip across the Sahara Desert to Mecca, it took 100 camels just to carry the gold that Mansa Musa gave away. Abraham was the father of many nations. Likewise, Africa was and is a continent of many nations. Ancient Africa had great civilizations and progressive empires like Mali, Ghana, Kush, and Nubia. Prior to American slavery, Africa had cities like the famous Timbuktu in Mali and one of the largest libraries. Scholars flocked there from many lands to study at the University of Timbuktu. During the 12th to 15th centuries, Timbuktu was an important city in Mali with a thriving economy due to trading its riches, gold, minerals, and dyes. It became a center of learning and scholarship. The University of Timbuktu boasted up to 12,000 students, and they studied physics, chemistry, philosophy, languages, medicine, surgery, mathematics, history, linguistics, geography, and art. Now here are two questions for you about ancient Africa. Question number one, was the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, kept in ancient Africa prior to slavery? The book Great Controversy by Ellen White mentions Africans that kept the Seventh-day Bible Sabbath. She writes about the Dark Ages when Rome's supremacy attempted to stamp out the Sabbath and force Sunday worship in Europe and in lands beyond. In chapter four of The Great Controversy on page 63, it says, in lands beyond the jurisdiction of Rome, there existed for many centuries bodies of Christians who remained almost wholly free from papal corruption. 
They were surrounded by heathenism and in the lapse of ages were affected by its errors. But they continued to regard the Bible as the only rule of faith and adhered to many of its truths. Now let's read this part together from the Great Controversy. Together, these Christians believed in the perpetuity of the law of God and observed the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. Churches that held to this faith and practice existed in Central Africa and among the Armenians of Asia. Great Controversy, page 63. You can read more about the Sabbath keeping in ancient Africa in the book Sabbath Roots, The African Connection, written by Elder Charles Bradford. Elder Bradford states that his interest in writing this book was piqued by a reference in Ellen White's book, The Great Controversy, page 578, that speaks about Sabbath keepers in Africa who, during the period of papal tyranny, remained faithful to the Bible Sabbath. Another book to consider is God in Africa Before the Missionaries by Dr. Sednak Yankson. And I met him at the general conference session we had recently and purchased a copy of his book. Question number two. Did ancient Africans have a written language and books before slavery? The answer is, just like the previous question, the answer is yes. Hundreds of thousands of manuscripts were written or copied in ancient Africa prior to the transatlantic slave trade. Recently, in 2012, Al-Qaeda, the terrorist group took control of Timbuktu and destroyed two of the buildings housing these ancient manuscripts. Fortunately, most of the books had been removed and hidden before Al-Qaeda took over. Recently, just a few years ago, the Ford Foundation and other international groups began a project to preserve and digitize these thousands of ancient African books. Yes, prior to American slavery, ancient Africa had written languages, scholars, engineers, a knowledge of the seventh day Bible Sabbath, mathematicians, doctors, medicine, books, armies, artists, sculptors, musicians, and scientists. Inventors, kings, administrators, surgeons, schools, and universities. Like Abraham, the father of many nations, Africa had many nations and advanced civilizations prior to the Atlantic slave trade. Now back to Abraham. In Genesis 15, 13, God gave a prophecy to Abraham. Let's read this prophecy together. Then the Lord said to him, know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes. The Israelites suffered for hundreds of years until the great deliverer used his servant Moses to confront Pharaoh, the ruling power, using physical plagues as a visible symbol of his omnipotence. God delivered his people. He supernaturally delivered the Israelites out of Egypt through dry, dry land through the Red Sea. Let's read together that mighty act of deliverance in Exodus 14, 13 and 14. Together, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, 
you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Didn't my Lord deliver the Israelites? Back to the African Americans. In 1619, the first ship arrived in the New World with captured Africans. And until, and until 1863, this people group was enslaved in America. They suffered greatly. Millions of Africans were removed from the motherland. Over 12 million and scattered across the globe. They were not allowed to speak their African languages, nor keep their African names, nor live together as families. They worked and gave free labor to this country for over 200 years. Frederick Douglass, in his autobiography, stated that as a child, he was fed like an animal, eating from a trough without a plate or spoon. He was separated from his mother, went barefoot, was given only a little shirt to wear as a child, no pants, was cold and hungry, lonely and confused. This was American slavery. Sojourner Truth stated in the book that she dictated that as a young woman, the man she loved was beaten savagely when he came from his neighboring plantation to her plantation to visit her, and she never saw him again. Apparently, that beating was fatal. She was forced to take an old man named Tom as her mate. Later in life, Sojourner Truth was baptized by Uriah Smith, funeralized in the Dime Tabernacle Seventh-day Adventist Church, and is buried in the cemetery near Ellen White. Africans cooked the food in the big house, but they couldn't eat it. They cut wood, hammered, and built the majestic plantation house, but they couldn't live in it. You can visit the South today and tour some of those plantation mansions built by slave labor. Even the White House in Washington, D.C. was built by slave labor. And there's a special exhibit in the United States Capitol building commemorating that fact. African slaves lived in sparse, rough cabins with one door and maybe one window and slept on the ground or in makeshift beds. You can visit some of those slave cabins still standing today. The Seventh-day Adventist School, Oakwood University, used to be a slave plantation. And when the Adventist church purchased that property in Huntsville, Alabama, there were slave cabins still standing. You can also go to Hampton University in Virginia, that's my mother's alma mater, and there is a slave cabin still standing there as well. Africans were not allowed to speak their native languages, nor were they allowed to go to school in America to learn how to speak English. They had to learn how to speak English the best way they could. It was even against the law to teach a slave to read or write. With harsh punishments and cruel beatings, separations and deprivations, these enslaved ones cried out for deliverance. Some were allowed to go to the church of the plantation owner and sit in the balcony. And so they heard about Daniel in the lion's den and the wonderful story of the Israelites and how the great deliverer rescued them. At night, they would slip away into the woods and hold their own services deep in the forest among the stately trees. They sang and prayed. Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel? Then why not me? Why not the African slave? Why not every man? Many attempted to run away to freedom when they heard about a better land, a land of freedom. Just follow the North Star. Follow the drinking cord. 
brave abolitionists like the Quakers and early Adventists, along with free blacks like William Still, secretly assisted them on the Underground Railroad. The tracks to that secret railroad ran from the Deep South all the way to Michigan, not far from here. And the terminal was in Detroit. You can learn more about the Underground Railroad by visiting the African American Museum in Detroit, which is the largest museum of its kind in the world. At this time, around the 1840s and 1850s, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was not yet formed, but early Sabbatarian Adventists like Joshua Himes, Uriah Smith, James White, Joseph Bates, John Loughborough, and Ellen White were active abolitionists. Uriah Smith, the longest serving editor of the Advent Herald and Sabbath Review, wrote about slavery in 1861 with these words, the North has joined hands with the South in oppressing the colored man. Profession to be a Christian nation, the people have set at naught the precepts of Christianity in their treatment of their colored brethren, forgotten the exhortations of God and unheeded his warnings. Ellen White detested slavery. She wrote about church members who promoted pro-slavery with these words, your views of slavery cannot harmonize with the sacred important truths for this time. You must yield your views or the truth. Both cannot be cherished in the same heart, for they are at war with each other. Testimonies, Volume 1, page 359. Thousands of enslaved Africans escaped on the Underground Railroad. Safe houses along the dangerous journey comforted the weary passengers. One of those safe houses is still standing in Pennsylvania on the campus of the Seventh-day Adventist boarding school called Pine Forge Academy and the home of abolitionist Thomas Rutter is on the campus. There are also secret tunnels for hiding and transporting the slaves on the campus of Pine Forge Seventh-day Adventist campus. One runaway was Frederick Douglass, who was mentioned earlier. In 1833, Frederick Douglass witnessed the falling of the stars that was predicted in the Bible, Matthew 24, 29, and Revelation 6, 13. Frederick Douglass was a 15-year-old slave in Maryland when the stars fell, and he later wrote about it with these words. I witnessed this gorgeous spectacle and was awestruck. The air seemed filled with bright descending messengers from the sky. It was about daybreak when I saw this sublime scene. I was not without the suggestion at that moment that it might be the harbinger of the coming of the Son of Man. And in my then state of mind, I was, I was prepared to hail him as my friend and deliverer. I had read that the stars shall fall from hell, heaven, and they were now falling. I was suffering very much in my mind. I was looking away to heaven for the rest denied me on earth. So in this quote, Frederick Douglass referred to God as his friend and deliverer. In 1838, Frederick Douglass successfully ran away to the north and joined the abolitionist movement as an ardent speaker and writer. Later, he and his wife, Anna, had five children. One of them was Rosetta Douglas Sprague, who became a Seventh-day Adventist and attended church in Washington, DC. There are underground safe houses still standing in Michigan, and many are near this church 
There's one in Romulus, Michigan that you can tour and others in Farmington Hills, Ann Arbor, and many other locations, plus the famous Second Baptist Church in Detroit. Check it out. Investigate these sites online and then take a tour and see for yourself the secret rooms and hiding places in these safe houses scattered throughout Michigan. In 1850, America passed the Fugitive Slave Act that allowed slave catchers in the North to track down, capture, and return a runaway slave to his former owner in the South. So now, it's against the law to help a runaway slave. It's against the law to hide him in your house. What do you think Ellen G. White thought about that law? She, you're right, she spoke out strongly against obeying the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act. This is what she said in Testimonies, Volume 1, page 264. The Fugitive Slave Act was calculated to crush out of man every noble, generous feeling of sympathy that should arise in his heart for the oppressed and suffering slave. It was in direct opposition to the teaching of Christ God's scourge is now upon the North because they have so long submitted to the advances, advances of the slave power. Ellen White gives clear counsel not to obey this unjust law. Ladies, let's read the first quote and men, would you read the second quote that Ellen G. White wrote in Volume 1 of Testimonies, page 201. Ladies, the law of our land requiring us to deliver a slave to his master, we are not to obey, and we must abide the consequences of violating this law. Men, the slave is not the property of any man. God is his rightful master, and man has no right to take God's workmanship into his hands and claim him as his own. Yes, Ellen White detested slavery and spoke out about obeying an unjust and immoral law. Are there any issues in our country today that we should speak out against like Ellen White and the Sabbatarian Adventists did? Should we speak out about anything in our communities today? Should we speak out about deportations in Hispanic communities or Muslim travel bans or over policing in police, sorry, over policing in black communities, gun purchase laws, racial incarceration disparities, clean water contaminants, and so on? Should we, like the Adventist abolitionists, be a voice for the voiceless, as stated in the Bible, in Proverbs 31, 8 through 10, where it commands, and let's read this together, speak out on behalf of the voiceless and for the rights of all who are vulnerable. Speak out in order to judge with righteousness and to defend the needy and the poor. On to the Civil War. Did you know that Ellen G. White predicted the Civil War? She wrote in Testimonies, Volume 1, 264, God is punishing this nation for the high crime of slavery. He has the destiny of the nation in his hands. He will punish the South for the sin of slavery, and the North for so long suffering its overreaching and overbearing influence. Testimonies, volume one, page 264. The quote continues, God will restrain his anger but a little longer. His anger burns against this nation, and especially against the religious bodies who have sanctioned and have themselves engaged in this terrible merchandise. 
The quote continues, the cries and sufferings of the oppressed have reached unto heaven and angels stand amazed at the hard-hearted, untold, agonizing suffering man in the image of his maker causes his fellow man. The names of such are written in blood, crossed with stripes, and flooded with agonizing, burning tears of suffering. God's anger will not cease until he has caused the land of light to drink the dregs of the cup of his fury." End quote. And so, as predicted, the Civil War began. This war between the states killing over 600,000 culminated with the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, which took effect on January 1, 1863. Is it a coincidence that the Seventh-day Adventist Church was officially organized in the same year? I think not. Didn't my Lord deliver the African Americans? Yes, God providentially delivered the African slaves. Heavenly intervention is especially seen in the Battle of Bull Run. Just as God opened the Red Sea to deliver the Israelites, God sent an angel into the Civil War to ultimately deliver the Africans. Ellen White was shown the supernatural intervention of God in this pivotal battle in Manassas, Virginia. She writes in Testimonies, Volume 1, page 267, I had a view of the disastrous battle in Manassas, Virginia. It was a most exciting, distressing scene. The Southern Army had everything in their favor and were prepared for a dreadful contest. The Northern Army was moving on with triumph, not doubting but that they would be victorious. Let's read the rest of this quote together, out responsively. I'll read one and three, and would you read two and four? The Northern men were rushing on, although their destruction was very great. Audience? It appeared to the northern men that their troops were retreating when it was not so. In reality, and a precipitate retreat commenced. Audience? The quote continues, and would permit no more losses to the northern men in his wisdom that in his wisdom he saw fit to punish them for their sins. And had the Norman, Northern Army at this time pushed the battle still further in their fainting, exhausted condition, the far greater struggle and destruction which awaited them would have caused great triumph in the South. God would not permit this and sent an angel to interfere. The sudden falling back of the Northern troops is a mystery to all. They know not that God's hand was in the matter. Yes, African Americans were delivered, as Exodus 14 says, do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. Yes, the Lord did fight for the African Americans. Just as surely as God providentially, intentionally, and directly delivered the Israelites from Egyptian slavery, he likewise providentially, intentionally, and directly delivered the Africans from American slavery. Yes, God is the great deliverer. After the Civil War ended, Ellen White counseled the church to minister to the newly freed slaves. She says, in test, she says, the Lord has looked with sadness upon that most pitiful of all sights, the colored race in slavery. He desires us in our work for them to remember their providential deliverance from slavery. 
their common relationship to us by creation and by redemption, and their right to the blessings of freedom, end quote. The Civil War ended, and four million of God's children have been set free. Four million people who were not allowed to learn to read or write. Four million people who were not allowed to legally marry or to remain in family units, who were degraded and regarded as animals and property. Now what? What is to become of them? This story is very personal to me because my great-grandfather was one of those slaves set free in 1863. They were set outdoors and given neither a mule nor 40 acres. Ellen G. White counseled the church to minister to these newly freed slaves. Did the church obey her pleadings? Sadly, the Seventh-day Adventist church resisted her pleadings. She says, I greatly desire to impress your minds with the importance of doing what you can to help forward the work for the colored people in the southern states. In this field, there are thousands and thousands of Negroes, many of whom are ignorant and in need of the gospel. Upon the white people of the United States, the Lord has laid the burden of uplifting this race. But as yet, Seventh-day Adventists have done comparatively little to help them. Sadly, the Adventist church leaders did not heed her counsel. But her son, her renegade son, Edson, who had left the church, Edson did. He came back, and God used her son, Edson. He built the Morning Star mission boat right here in Michigan, and it began its noble work traveling from Michigan down the Mississippi River to teach and evangelize. As a result, many churches were started and eventually Oakwood Industrial School opened with 16 students. Do you know who one of those 16 students was? It was, one of them was Etta Littlejohn, who is the mother of Elder Charles Bradford, who became the first black president of the North American Division of Seventh-day Adventists and whose book was mentioned earlier. Ellen White wrote much counsel about this school in Alabama, and she even visited the campus. And you can go to the campus and see the house where Ellen White slept. The house is still standing there. The same God who delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt and the Africans from slavery in America wants to deliver us from the slavery to sin. The last people to consider today is fallen humanity. We, like the Israelites and the Africans, came from a place of great riches. The Garden of Eden was clothed with every delight for the senses and contained every agent for health and eternal happiness. But man forfeited that happy place of great riches and chose a place of darkness and separation. After the flood, Noah's sons gave rise to many nations, great riches and many nations. For 4,000 years, this earth and its inhabitants suffered. The earth groaned. Decay and destruction, hatred and sorrow resulted in great suffering, but the great deliverer heard our cry. He stepped onto the pages of our story and rescued us through his incarnation, perfect life, death, and resurrection. Yes, Jesus Christ is our great deliverer. Exodus 14, 13, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you and me today. The Lord will fight for you. Hallelujah. Can you say hallelujah for the great deliverer? Hallelujah for the great deliverer. And today he is calling us 
to step into his glorious space of obedience and joy, surrender and happiness. Today, Jesus, the Red Sea opener, the slave chain breaker, the runaway slave's helper, the abolitionist encourager, that same Jesus who was Sojourner's truth, Harriet's guide, and Frederick's protector, that same Jesus is inviting us to let him deliver us from anything holding us back from the peace and security of a life-saving connection with heaven. Let's remember his mighty acts of deliverance of the past and allow him to deliver us today. The great deliverer is calling. <laughs>